Welcome back. I have had so many incredible entrepreneurs reach out to uh, me that are fans of this program and also that have joined uh, my Men of Action Mentoring Program. And uh, so many of them have several questions, usually about how to grow their business, how to 10x their business, how to, to work on their, their sales funnel, their back end, a ton of questions about paid traffic. And so I wanted to take some time because we, I've had so, many, so much exposure, especially having Ty Lopez on yesterday, uh, so much exposure to this e-commerce space that I wanted to get some experts on here to answer some questions that I've been getting recently about, about, the, uh, about growing your business. So today, we're really, really fortunate because we have a guy on here. Uh, he was a superstar, door-to-door -door salesman initially with Canadian Property Stars, and then later turned out he, he has helped build many online SAAS companies. He owns a company called Sales Process. Process.io. He has built incredible sales funnels for absolutely some of the top tier people you've ever seen. Several seven and eight figure businesses. So we're very, very lucky to have him on here. It's Mr. Nick Cosman. How are you doing today, Nick? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Of course, of course, man. So yeah, my sales team is actually a huge fan of yours. Uh, they subscribe to your program. Then they got me onto it. And I and this is something that I've always been uh, really interested in because in my in my uh in my from my standpoint you know the the idea of how the sales funnel work was just something i just didn't understand very well and it's something that i'm learning about more i think a lot of people they get into business and they think well i have a great idea and i'm just going to make money because this is a meritocracy and it isn't there's so many things that you have to do in order to get out to those leads that you want so a really really a really fortunate for us to have you here first thing i want to talk about you went you were originally doing door to door sales uh, that that seems like a, a pretty amazing transition, and you were very very successful at. It. Could you talk about that, and then the transition from that into uh, e-commerce? Sure. So I was studying um, applied physics at school. That was my uh, university, and I had to I had loans, right? So I had to pay for these loans somehow. And um, between third and fourth year. I somehow got involved in door-to-door -door sales just because I heard there was some money there and I was attracted to it. So I started knocking doors, learned sales, uh, ingested all the sales material that I could, got to practice like 200 times a day. I became the top salesperson in that company within a month. And uh, that built some confidence, that built up my capital, I was able to pay off my loans. And then from there, I started uh, ingesting some business books and learning about entrepreneurship and building offers. And I started a few businesses, um, a door to the first successful one was a door to door auto detailing business. Cause I understood the door to door sales channel pretty well. I knew how to build teams and manage teams and whatnot. So I, uh, did a door to door auto detailing business that worked. Then I wanted something with more leverage. So I started building software. And, um, so it was, it was like an online tutoring business we used software in the back end to help deliver the service. And um, that was okay. It wasn't like a grand slam. Um, so I, as I was building the software, I realized that, hey, I, I, I should probably learn from someone who's already successful with the SaaS business. So then I reached out to one of the most uh, successful entrepreneurs at the time in Toronto. He was uh, in his 20s. He was a software guy. His name is Derek. I reached out to him and said, hey, do you need any help with anything with the intention just to learn. And he's like, yeah, I do. I, I have this new project. I offer to sell it uh, for him for free. I was just like, Hey, like, give me the product. Let me go door to door. And I, I went to malls and signed up all, it was a recruitment, um, a shift based recruiting solution for uh, malls. So I went to the mall and signed up all these managers and um, that ended up working. And then I built a sales team for that product um, and scaled it up and they were still, they were pre-product market fit, which means the product wasn't fully like developed. So we were building and developing at the same time. And I built out the sales team, got some traction and uh, that company ended up doing pretty well. And at the, at the same time I was in an incubator, um, there were some other so software companies or SAS, the SS, SAAS is the SAS companies or software companies. Um, they were, they were watching me build the sales team. And, and one of them in particular, it was a company called advisor stream. The guy's name was Kevin Mulhern. He was like, Hey, I need a sales team. Exactly what you built here. We need it done at ours, uh, at our company. And, uh, he already had a product. It was working at a few case studies, but he didn't have any marketing and sales solved. So I built the marketing funnel. I built the sales team and we scaled it up to a million in annual recurring revenue in 12 months from a standing start. And we did this while being pretty capital efficient, which means like we didn't we didn't spend 
10,000 to get a customer for 2000, right? Which is pretty common in the SaaS world when there's like infinite money running around. Um, So we did it efficiently. And then he went on to scale, he scaled it up past five and uh, past 10 million. And then he ended up selling the company to Broadridge, which is a cool case study. It took a few more years after, but I got him off the ground. Uh, With that case study, I, uh, I, I made some, I got a good reputation of like growing so- yeah. software businesses. So another company reached out to me, co-pilot advisor was selling to financial advisors, similar market to Kevin's uh, advisor stream. And he's like, Hey, whatever you did at advisor stream, do it over here. So I went into his company, built a sales funnel, built a sales team. We learned that the product needed to change because it wasn't uh, addressing the most urgent problem of the financial advisor. So we got our engineering hats on. We we changed up the product. We like we I literally went to the whiteboard with Henry, the CEO, changed up the product, relaunched it, uh, scaled it up to a million annual recurring revenue in ten months. So it was a little shorter, but this was from a standing start. And uh, he went on to to scale it up further. He started selling into the enterprise. Company was valued at like seventy five million bucks. And uh, with that, with those two case studies, I started doing consulting. And so I packaged my process up called Sales Process IO, how I scaled businesses efficiently. And then I sold it to 2000 software companies. Um, so f- over the last few, uh, three years, yeah, I've been selling the, the process to software companies. A lot of these big guys from like Y Combinator, Greylock, uh, Sequoia, some of these big accelerators were using my sales process. Um, and, and, uh, and methods to, to get traction. And, um, yeah, I create a lot of value. A lot of my companies have big exits and yeah, it's just been going, I've just been doing my thing. So, so Nick, a lot of the people that are watching my show, they, they're f- unfamiliar with several of the terms that you use. I, I, I was listening to a lot of the stuff that you were doing yesterday. A SaaS company is software as primary service. What, what does that mean again? Software as a service. It's software just like a, service, a, right. it's like a license. Okay. Right. So this license. could be this could be this could be e-commerce. This could be online coaching. This could just anything that's not necessarily just a physical product. That's right. I like <clears throat> e- e- the things you really want to sell. Coaching is good because the yeah. it's so efficient, right? Like it's yeah. a, you're selling logins, yeah. right? Um, and it's delivered over the internet, which is like pretty instant. So coaching, training, software, financial services like loans mortgages like that stuff scales really nicely yeah okay so that that's it the se- second thing is uh thing you just you know went over about hiring a sales team uh in a sales team because yeah. i have a, a ton of questions i'm a former u.s military officer we talk about team building and obviously nice. it's like one of the main things we we go over in in your situation when you're building a sales team a lot of these these people are remote and they are you're giving them a script and the script is designed based on what the the problems that the founder is trying to determine that need to be solved could you go into that a little bit yeah so this is a, a misconception with this the sales team stuff so sales teams are really easy to build if you have an insanely good marketing engine so <clears throat> it's not like it's not necessary if you if you charge me with say you want say nick i want a sales team i want 100 people i want to be jordan belfort and have a massive sales team. Well, the first thing you're going to need is a really, you need a, a, a marketing flywheel, which means you can spend X amount on a paid tra- some scalable channel like paid traffic or in Jordan Belfort's case, because everyone likes that movie, right? Yeah. He, his marketing channel was the cold calling channel. So he, the, the success behind his, his sales team was the cold calling channel that he was able to leverage. We're talking about before the movie. After the movie, the movie actually is part of his. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this okay. was in the, in he, the early the, 90s. The thing, when we talk about Jordan Belfort, there's two Jordan Belforts. There's pre-felony Jordan Belfort, who's taking Quaaludes and is back cold calling guys for pink slips. And then there's yeah. uh, Pink Sheet, sorry. And then there's post-Jordan Belfort, who's got a podcast and is married and is clean, has not been on drugs, and he was doing yep. Ty Lopez. And this guy is like incredibly famous because you know Leonardo DiCaprio did an incredible incredible, right. probably yeah. one of the most memorable depictions of any human being in the last hundred years is in that movie. So, so yes, yeah. for, for sure that we have to, that, cause I, a lot of people get confused. Those are two different Jordans. Those yeah. are two different I know Jordan, Jordan too. I yeah. personally know him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but the, the point is like, if you, like, if you want to build a big sales team, you need a marketing flywheel, you need a, a marketing, uh, trick, right? So, um, yeah. And Jordan's pre, uh, indictment or whatever you want to call it phase it was it was uh cold calling that yeah. he was able to exploit that channel very well um nowadays 
well, it changes. There's F- Facebook a- ads had its heyday. Ty Lopez, you mentioned him earlier. Yeah. He had his heyday with uh, YouTube ads. He was actually one of the first buyers on YouTube. He bought up like tons of the inventory when there were hardly any advertisers, right? Yeah. Um, there's uh, Google ads and there's uh, now it's like influencer influencer stuff. There's podcasts, that's a channel, right? So the point is you want to find, before you build a sale, the, the sales team success is a function of the marketing channel. And so- First thing that someone needs to do is 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 build a marketing funnel that just prints appointments on the calendar, prints leads without having to do much, and then you start building the team to farm those leads, and you develop systems and competitive structures and incentive programs and uh, and like fun dynamics to 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 get the most out of those leads. But the the, the team will fail if you don't have that marketing. Right. Um, a marketing channel established. Yeah. Uh, so, so can we talk about this? A lot of people might not understand what this is an offer. You talked about this several times. Uh, I just finished the hundred million dollar offer that book and, and reading uh, some other books about Rick, uh, uh, Richard Brunson. Uh, can you talk yeah. about how that offer is the thing where you almost feel I, I loved the video and we're going to talk about this later of you and Grego Gallagher, where you're basically saying you can't afford to not take my program. That was awesome. Um, can you talk about an offer and how that is something that the sales team would use in order to get people to uh, to come through the funnel? Yeah. So th- that's there's three things you need. Like there's the marketing funnel. You need the sales convert. Like you need to have a process to convert uh, leads into sales, and then you need an offer, right? You something to sell. So it at the end of the day, it needs to provide value. It needs to solve some some preferably urgent problem for the prospect and a valuable problem for the prospect that they're going to pay money for. So if it's like, there's different, everyone's got problems and they have different priorities. If your offer addresses one of the most urgent and painful problems, then you're not going to have a hard time selling it and uh, you can charge a high amount for it. And then another part of the offer is the gross uh, margin of the offer. And this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier in the in the interview. Um, some offers are more profitable than others. For, ex- for example, SaaS and online programs and yeah. coaching and mortgages, those are all very, very profitable because the 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 um the cost to fulfill on them is is like 10% or 15%. Whereas in like a service, if you're selling something for like 100 k it maybe it's like fifty thousand dollars it costs you to fulfill it. Right, so that's a fifty percent gross margin. So you want something that's high ticket and very high gross margin, which means most of it is profit, and then uh, you slap on a really good marketing channel and a sales uh, conversion system. You're going to make a lot of money. You know, yeah. one one thing you talked about. We have a, a module in MO Advance that's literally called spending forty eight thousand dollars to make fifty thousand uh, dollars, and it's and it talks about what you said before. I I knew this guy. You know, whenever he had a big client, it was bottle service. We'd go to the strip club. We'd do all this kind of stuff. And then the guy, like, you'd end up spending nine grand and the guy would spend eleven, you know, $10,000. And I'm like, why do we do all this? Like, we still got right. plane ticket. Like, why are we out here? And you brought up, it's really important, the bootstrapping aspect to it and how how important it is, how a lot of times you shouldn't take money even if you can because it causes a, a certain level of urgency. I love this idea. Uh, we filmed our first product, it was 800 bucks. That's how much it cost me to build. I, I'm a, I'm, I used to be a videographer, so I, I did all the stuff myself. And, and uh, it was 800 bucks for us, for our production cost for the whole thing and did you know almost seven figures. And so I, I really, really liked this point that you brought up before uh, because I have some friends of mine. Um, actually, I'll tell you right now. I know somebody who tried to get Dan Bilzerian to film this pro- program. is 85 grand. And I was like, why? And he's filming on like a Canon uh, 7D or some garbage camera. And I was like, what What are you doing? So I, I do I do like this, this concept of bootstrapping. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah. Okay. So we could define. So bootstrapping is essentially building a business without raising any money or taking on any debt, right? So doing it as lean as you possibly can. Um, and then growing it efficiently. So one reason why you want to bootstrap is, well, first of all, it's hard to get financing yeah. if you're not, if you're not, uh, you, uh, don't have those skills. Um, so it's easy. If you're just starting out, it's typically easier to bootstrap. Um, another reason why you want to is because you're forced to, to actually make the business work yeah. in the bootstrap when you have a lot of stress on 
on uh, when the environment's very, very stressful, you, you're forced to make stuff work, which means you're not building things that shouldn't be built because you can't afford to. You're not doing activities that shouldn't be done because you can't afford to. You don't have enough time. I you never that. run out of money. I love that. Right? Yeah. So what the, with the bootstrap stress, it, it it's like a it it puts it makes the th- sure that the thing should exist, and then if you're able to grow it bootstrapped then you know that the product or service should probably exist and you've actually solved an efficient way to distribute the, 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 the solution. So I like bootstrapping and that to a certain point. And then when we know that it works, then we'll go raise money and like scale the crap out of it. But if you try to raise money too early, you you don't get that pressure cooker sort of like diamond right? It's you want a small, intense fire before you go and scale something. And you're only going to get that intense fire under under pressure. And if you yeah. do that, you might get to the point where you don't need outside capital. Uh, because, That's true. Yeah. yeah. Like some some businesses don't need a, a outsized uh, capital in winner take all markets, though, like big, like big opportunities. Like if you don't take capital, you're going to get some really sh- savvy Silicon Valley guy right. that's going to come steal it and then and then and run it like those so sometimes like time is a factor, but that's only certain types of businesses. Nick, were you always extroverted? Cause I'm curious, cause we get, went back, let's go back to the door to door sales thing. I know this is a question I get a lot from my clients because I do some performance coaching and they're always, there's always this debate about being naturally extroverted uh, and met that making you better with sales or making deals or better with women for that matter is, were you always naturally extroverted or is this something that you taught yourself? Um, I'm, I I am what I am, what I need to be at the time. Got right. It. So like, if I need to be extroverted, I'll be extroverted. If I need to be introverted and do writing or coding or something, then I have, then I'll force myself to do that. So I think it's just like, yeah, if you, whatever you're doing, like you're adapt to the, to that activity. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. I tell some of my clients that have a real trouble, a lot of trouble with coming out and being a little bit more expressive. I'm like, make up a, a person in your head and that's the guy who's being more expressive. If that's what you got to do, right? Because a lot yeah. of times that's the situation because you do come off as very, really well on camera. Uh, I thought it was really, really good. So I was always wondering, you know, if you trained yourself to be like that or if that was something that came natural to you. Um, this is another thing that I'm really a huge fan of. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't talk about it, we show it in, in my program. And you talk about, you don't use the word irrefutable visual evidence, that's, a, that's our term. You use testimonials and you use, I love whenever people show me Stripe accounts. I love when people are just like, you, like you keep all your marketing over here and then here's your theory, here's how much money we made. See, this is my client, this is not me. I always say, this is my client, this is not me. Do you see how much money he made? And then you show irrefutable evidence of like, I love beating people, uh, I know this might be not the term you use, but I love beating people over the head with irrefutable visual evidence. We don't talk yeah. about it, we be about it. More evidence, fewer words. More evidence, fewer words. That's what I try to tell people. Can you talk about this? Because you you do go heavy into te- talking about testimonials and case studies. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that you need, like, to get a marketing message, uh, to work, to influence first, you need some, you need a claim, right. That's, that's, uh, desirable for the prospect, right? So that's the one dimension. The claim needs to be desirable. And the second dimension is they need to believe you, right? So you could have some, you think you can have a desirable claim, but they don't believe you. Uh, it's not going to work. You can have something where they believe you, but it's not desirable. It's not going to work. So you need those two, uh, two things. And so the, the fastest way to get some, uh, uh, to cause that believability is to just show proof or testimony. Um, do, do you have the problem, yeah. the believability thing? Do you ever have, so I, we'll use Greg as a, a great example, Greg O'Gallagher. I don't know if you saw the video he just recently did with more plates, more dates, where they were going over his blood work to try to see if he was on sauce, if he was taking steroids, right? Yeah. And, and, and by the way, it's clickbait. He doesn't. Like, I, I'm sorry to give you guys the spoiler because it makes it seem like uh, Derek is going to call him out. He doesn't call him out. Uh, at the end of it, but yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Greg's, Greg's my like yeah. my best friend. I've known him for yeah. years, yeah. and yeah, he doesn't do any of that. He's strong as shit. Yeah. I don't know how. Like, I, yeah, I just know about him through Brandon Carter, who's one of my buddies. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so watching that now, you said the believability. How does Greg? So I have the same. I have a similar problem. If you see my IG, I have this this issue where I'll throw these events, and there'll be like fifty girls at my birthday party, and they're like, "You paid them all," and I'm like, "I didn't pay a single girl." 
Not only did I not pay them, I, ta I tag them in the videos. You can message every single one of them. I didn't pay anybody to come to my shit. I just throw incredible social circle events. How does Greg get past that? How would somebody who maybe has an offer for something that they're incredible at, they're, they're maybe they're cl closing an unbelievably high number of sales, or they're incredibly good at building a social circle or some kind of social network, or they're incredibly good at getting somebody six packs. Like, 10x better than the rest of the people in that industry because that's what you were talking about with Greg O'Gallagher. He posts before other people post before and after pictures that he'd be embarrassed to post. How right. how so? How do you deal with believability when somebody is that far above uh, the rest of their competitors? It's really just demonstrating, right? Like one of Greg's, like his um, differential, like his difference is his strength. So like, there's a lot of guys that look good, right? But Greg's like pushing like 225 over his head, which is unique, yeah. right? And he's 175 pounds That's or 180 crazy. pounds, yeah. Yeah. right? So there's there's a there's a real unique factor there. Even if you are doing like there's guys that do steroids and stuff, and they're not even as strong, like yeah. that. So. Um, that's like the one thing with Greg. So really, what he needs to do is just push heavy weight, and uh, that just cuts through the noise. And then also his testimonials, like they look really good. The one difference with Greg's testimonials is that there are guys that take his program and then they go and they get acting jobs. Wow. Right. That, okay. That's a, un, that's a unique thing with, yeah. the, uh, with the fitness program, right? It's not just getting better dates or better getting in shape. It's you're so you're good enough to go get an acting job. Yeah. Right. So um, that's, that's unique. Yeah. So with your results, you need something that is, that is truly unique, um, for it to, for it to cut through the noise. Yeah. Man, I have like 35 testimonials on my website and I still get people that are just like, yeah, none of this is real. This can't be real. And it's just, it's really interesting when you yeah. say the believability part of it, but then you, I, but, you but then can't I, convince everyone though. Like there's, yeah. there's a whole business out there that is like the, it's like, uh, like, uh, challenging claims. Yeah. Right. Like there's like Reddit people and there's people that get a lot of views because that's like, they, they, that gets a lot of attention. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's going to be skeptics. There's the whole business out there that, that thrives on that whole yeah. principle. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. So, uh, going back to what you said before there, there is a video of you and Greg. And one of the things I really liked was when you started talking about the ripple effect of you not taking my program, I made, I actually went last night when I saw that and I made an ad for my program, specifically kind of the same thing about the epidemic of men in their middle ages who suffer from depression and how, you know, a lot of these guys are in terrible physical condition and have terrible social lives. And so this is something you can't afford to not do. Can you talk about this? Where, where did you come? Is that a marketing strategy for you? Hey, you can't afford to not yeah. take this pro program. So what, what that is, is like, it, it's called a linear uh, sales argument, right? So that's one, one thing that you, we do when we're working with a customer is we create what's called a, it's called a dynamic sales letter. And it's, it's a pitch or it's a dynamic uh, pitch. It's dynamic because the market changes and technology changes. So it needs to, 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 uh, to adapt. Um, but in the pitch, there's a, there's a, a linear way of getting to the conclusion of buying right and so you need uh some sales trainers call this a rational argument yeah. right there's a rational argument and there's an emotional argument is to buy and you need two you need both of those so that linear rational argument needs to be rock solid which means um the the pros the, the prospect should buy it because he's gonna he's gonna get this benefit and if he doesn't buy it here's the opportunity cost and that needs to be explicitly uh uh, uh, communicated in, in the, in the sales letter. Yeah. That's incredible, man. Yeah. That, that one was really, uh, that one spoke to me when I saw that because I used to not be in good shape. Uh, and when I saw that, I was like, yeah, that's something that would be really effective. That, that, that kind of sales copy. Um, let's talk about this. You, one thing that I loved, um, I, I'm going to skip around here because this was probably the thing I heard you say that, that stuck with me the most was stay away from that feeling. I have, um, I tell a lot of people, the first year you're in my program, zero creativity. I want you to just learn from mentors. Uh, I say, if you want to, if you've done 10,000 heart transplants, then you get to trust your gut. If you've been in relationships, you know, over the course of several decades and you've had several successful relationships, then you can trust your gut about relationships. 
a lot of people want to trust their gut when it comes to business and they don't have any experience or they haven't had any success. And I, I frequently tell people if it comes down between your gut or something, your mentor who is highly successful is saying, always go with the mentor and go away from your gut. Can you go into that? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that point. So when you're, when you're starting, um, there's people that have, they're contrary to a lot, a lot of what people think there's only like a few paths. Okay. So if somebody's successful at something, there's a reason why they're successful. They took us, they took a path mm. and it, you don't know that path because if you did, you, you'd already be on, you'd already be going down it. Um, and the cost of, of figuring out the path on your own is so high. Yes. That's why it's so like, it's, that's why everyone fails, right? Like there's only like five paths, like, and it depends on where you are in the world, what, what your predispositions are, what your, uh, what access to resources you have. Right. So when you find somebody who's like somewhat similar to your initial conditions and they, and they, uh, went down a path and they're successful, <clears throat> you stick to them like glue and you do everything that everything that they say without any question. Yeah. And you, and you execute to spec because you, you can bet that they spent a ton of money and a ton of time and took a ton of damage to figure out what that path is. Yeah. And they're giving you like the keys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Speed of implementation and suspension of disbelief. That's why. Yeah. yeah. You only can get, you can only start getting creative when you mastered the yes. thing, right? Like <clears throat> once you've like done it better than the person, then you can start, you know, changing your angle by 10 degrees and, and getting a little cute. Yeah. But to do that before is, is not smart. I, I tell, I tell my clients copy people's captions word for word. It's funny. Cause this is a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about, but a, a huge e-commerce business right now is only fans. And those girls, I have my friend, Kylie Myers. Uh, she, she's making, you know, several seven, almost eight figures on, on OF. And she's got, she's bought several houses from it. She goes every week, subscribes to a new girl's OnlyFans and just steals anything that she sees that's successful. She literally copies and pastes uh, the captions word for word off there. And, and, and I tell people this all the time, like uh, I have uh, <clears throat> some clients that like want to build up their, their social media. And I literally like there's this photo that all my clients have. It's in the Valley of Fire where they're standing. There's like a drone shot behind them. And I tell them, copy that exact photo. Every single one of you do this. You only have 200 Instagram followers. No one gives a shit. And I love that. I love this idea of like subverting because here's the problem that I see frequently, Nick, and I'm sure you see this too. People who come into this industry are generally smart, analytically smart people. And when they see somebody do something that just feels not that smart to them, then they like, well, oh, I can do this better, even though they don't have any experience in the marketplace. And one of the big issues that I have is like people trying to make super compl complex arguments on like Instagram. Instagram is not, Instagram is a short form content type, type of place where it needs to be punchy and you need to get to the point very quickly. And they're, they're making these long drawn out arguments. And I'm like, man, this is not, you're too smart for this. You need to listen to mentors and just do exactly what they say. No, like what you said before, zero creativity until you achieve mastery. I, I just find that it is very hard for guys with high IQs to do that because they're so sure that they're smarter than just, let's say Jake Paul, whoever. They're so sure that they're smarter than some celebrity who's marketing themselves or some online coach, and it's just very difficult to get them to like see, no man, you need to, you need to sub subvert your ego and just listen to what other people have to tell you. Yeah, yeah, I would argue that the people that you think are not smart, or like, so, like one would think are not smart, are actually smarter. Oh, hell yeah. Because they're smart enough to realize that they need to communicate differently on the platform yeah. one example is this is uh ty lopez yeah. right ty lopez is a very smart guy bright dude but yeah. he to, to a lot of people he comes off as not that he comes off as working class he he, he comes off his working class he does that on but purpose me, but i have a lot of respect for him because he he's so uh versed that he is able to play that role right like he, he yeah so uh, you don't just accidentally make $150 million yeah. with a one offer. <laughs> like, Spe speaking of that, so I got to uh, interview Paris Hilton one time, and, and then afterwards yeah. we hung out for like three hours and just sitting there talking. 
And it was very clear when the cameras came off, I'm talking to, I'm talking to somebody with a 140 IQ. Like it was very clear that she's fronting for the rest of us. And now she's worth a yeah. billion dollars and not, it's not from Conrad's money. It's not from her granddad's money. She, this woman yeah. is worth a billion dollars on her own. And it, and here's the other thing, man, it's offensive to people when you tell them, well, I, I love when I tell people that Paris Hilton's smart, they're like, uh, they're angry at me. They're like, no, there's no way she's smart. You're making that up. And like, no, you just don't understand. Like, there's a different type of marketing. How angry people get whenever Jake Paul or Logan Paul get into a fight and they're marketing their fight and everyone wants to see Deontay Wilder or whoever beat the shit out of them. I'm like, you don't realize, like, you think that these are just some dumb kids talking noise. They have trapped you, like Floyd Mayweather. They have trapped you into this whole thing where you're talking about them and you don't even realize that they have marketed to you and completely taken you right down their sales funnel while you're still calling them dumb. It, to, to me, I, it's exactly what you said before. A lot of people, they put on, they front like that, that they're not as smart as they are. And then uh, when they get on the platform and then when you talk to them in private, you, you find out that they're a very different person. Yeah. It also takes a lot of courage, right? Yeah. Like you can, you can ha have a high IQ or whatnot, but no courage and you're not going to go out there and, yes. and, and yap. Right. So I, I appreciate anybody with courage. who's willing to get on, to go and fight Floyd Mayweather to go and do some sort of courageous, risky thing. Yeah. Because that's more rare than knowing how to do math or something. Yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about something else? This is something that was sure. very counterintuitive to me, uh, was pricing. Uh, you know, normally when you think about your, your, go to your economics class, I have two firms and one of them offers uh, the same product at a lower price. They should, they should dominate the market. However, in some of these, SaaS fields or e-commerce or especially when it comes to coaching, I found that I have competitors that are offering less than what I'm offering, but they're charging two or three times more and they're making more money because of it. Can you go over pricing uh, specifically the mistakes that a lot of people make when it comes to that? Sure. So there's two ways to price. Like there's only, there's two plays. One is you've got to be the most expensive. The other is you're the cheapest. Right. And so if you're the cheapest, you need a free distribution channel. And you need a technology that allows you to capture profit at the low end of the market. And this is from a book called uh, The Innovator Solution by Clayton Christensen. Uh, he spoke about this. And this is like the general concept. So if you're not, if you're not like, and typically, how do you get a technology advantage that allows you to capture profit at the low end of the market? You start at the high end of the market, develop capital and insights, and then that, that technology advantage trickles down into the low end of the market that allows you to capture profit. So most bit no most people are not doing that. <clears throat> so the def, like um, the way it, the way to do it is you you start at the high end of the market. So if you're going to build something brand new, you want to you you want to serve the highest most expensive customer that you can uh, that you can based on your skill set. Um, and so yeah, it's, pricing is simple. Just go go to the highest, charge the highest when you're starting. And then once you're developing capital and, and some insights that allow you to address the lower end of the market, then you can do so. So nice. Um, okay. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, can we talk about mentors? You actually talked about initially seeing Russell Brunson and trying to this backwards uh, engineer his offer. Can you talk about that real quick? Cause I, I was trying to follow you along cause there were lots of things on the chart there. How did you backwards uh, engineer his offer reverse engineers offer? Yeah. So I came from a world where, like <clears throat> you would raise a lot of money and then you would build a software business and then you would like struggle to get customers and you'd use your network and it would cost like, it was all LTV over CAC, which is like the lifetime value divided by the cost per acquisition. That was like the key metric. And it was like generally challenging for these cost for these businesses to get customers without raising a ton of money. And then Russell Brunson comes along and he gets to like a hundred million annual recurring revenue without any um, financing. And it's a SaaS business and it's hyper profitable. And so when I came across that, I was like, why isn't everyone in my industry like trying to backwards engineer that? Cause that's an anomaly. And so I stopped everything and just got into basically the mechanics of what he was doing. And then I took that, um, it basically it's long form dynamic sales letters. Uh, I took that and I applied it to the software world and that's how we created, uh, created some value. So yeah, I, I, when I saw it, I just, 
I just had to investigate. Yeah. What were the things that you discovered that maybe somebody else wouldn't have seen? When I reverse engineered yeah, the yeah, process? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So there's, this is one of the, this is the underlying principle of sales process. IO. it's the, the mar marketing is solved by dynamic sales letter. Okay. So the dynamic sales letter is the, it's, it's, Essentially, Expert Secrets is Russell's book, which is a sales letter. Yes. It's not dynamic because it's a book, but if you put it in a Word document, it could be dynamic. You could change it if you wanted to, right? So that was the thing that propelled the business. It was a, a long form sales letter that it was so good that it went, and it was so useful that it went viral. And so when a, with when a marketing piece goes viral, it it drops the cost of a lead down to almost zero. Wow. Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> so that mechanism is so powerful because you can spend a little bit of money on paid ads, right? And instead of having this non-viral marketing asset, just you, you're spending money and you're getting like this one to 1.2 X ratio or return, you can have this viral asset that you ship out into the world and you get unlimited leads and then you build as fast as you can to fulfill on the demand created from that marketing asset. So to me, that was like way better than the other way. Yeah. And so I started, I started going deep into sales letter mechanics and, and that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Wow. So this has been explained to me in a different way, but hearing it from you now, I totally understand. Cause my sales team is trying to explain this to me where we'll have a sales letter and it's for one specific niche uh, that we're marketing to. So for me as a yeah. performance coach, I have one niche that is fitness, one niche that is business, one niche that is networking, one niche that is dating. Uh, these are different niches in my business and they're, it's, a, it's a similar sales letter, but different ones for those different people. That's a, that now the way you explain it makes a lot more sense to me. Um, let's talk about this, uh, mentors. Who are your mentors? Uh, who are some of the people that you've had come in? Some that we, we have maybe never heard, <coughs> we've never heard of before, some that we have. Yeah. So my first mentor was, he taught me sales when I was 20 and he was uh, one of the, like a millionaire in Canada. It's, they're not as common as in the States. It's a little harder to do it in Canada. So when you come across one, like uh, you stick to them. So I, I learned from Ben, he, he operated a big door-to-door -door sales company. That was, that was awesome. Uh, I learned from Derek who built a, uh, a, so a software business. Um, I learned, I, I read all the, the I, Russell Brunson, Grant Cardone, Eugene Schwartz. Okay. Uh, the Baron letters, like I read a lot of books, um, did some coaching programs as well. Um, yeah, I, I uh, joined Sam Oven's program. He taught me, uh, Sam's really good at the, at the, the habits and the discipline stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I picked up some of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or were there any paradigm shifting books for you that you read? paradigm shifting like books that like so for me it would be like the one thing by gary keller that i had a yeah that's a good one had a serious I really problem like that. serious problem yeah. with multitasking uh and then that book was paradigm shifting for me the the uh the power of now by eckhart Tolle, the subtle art of not giving a fuck by mar manson those were paradigm shifting books for me did you have anything like that for you paradigm shifting um those the, those ones you mentioned are really yeah. good i like the intelligent investor oh, very like good. Ram, yeah, that's yeah. a good one mm -hmm. um yeah you know some crazy. of the copywriting books oh yeah yeah for sure for sure i'm eugene I, schwartz breakthrough advertising i like that one yeah, yeah. for sure uh, you know what's funny about the intelligent investor with uh, ben graham is that he uh when warren buffett reads that book initially he he's intending on going to harvard he has no idea that benjamin graham is a professor at columbia and he doesn't get accepted into Harvard. Something happens where he ends up going to Columbia and like, like this is his favorite book. And he accidentally ends up in Ben Graham's uh, uh, economics class, uh, business class. It's really, really interesting story about how it, it's very, I know it's not quite the same thing, but like I, I'm, a, I'm a Texas Longhorn, so is Dr. Buss. And that's yeah. partially how we connected, but it's kind of the same kind of kinship where it's like, I, uh, you know, accidentally my favorite author on this happened to, you know, be belong to the same 40 acres that I did. So that, that's yeah. pretty interesting. Can we talk about him, by the way? You, you uh, mentioned before, uh, does Dr. Buss have any influence when it comes to marketing? I know Dr. Gad Sad talks frequently about uh, you know, behavioral psychology when it comes to purchasing ideas. Is there, is there anything that you use from evolutionary psychology that helps you with your business? Yeah, so in the book, there's only like 
one axiom that bus re- like expands on and it's Hamilton's rule. Okay. And all of that, all of his, the, the rest of that book is like how it, he like bottom up explains all these phenomena based using that lens. So that it's like a, a core, a core, it's like a law of physics, right. That you probably should learn. Um, which is like, yeah. It, um, yeah. Hamilton's rule. So when I, when I learned that, that, that was useful. Yeah. yeah. It, it, wor- it, it explains a lot in marketing and sales and business. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I, I, you know, I studied astronomy in college as my, as a minor. And one of the things about physics is that we're always looking for a testable model. Your background is in physics. I love evolutionary psychology because I find it to be the only like real testable model in a soft science that is psychology. They go back, there's a 37 culture study, uh, which shows that, you know, it's pretty ubiquitous what men and look, women look for as far as attraction, as far as mating is concerned and how status works amongst different species. Uh, it's pretty amazing when it comes to pair bonding. That's why I like this so much. It, it's, do you, do you use some of the principles, like I, I'm sure maybe the, the scientific method from physics, do you use that when it, when it, when you, when it comes to you testing different ideas uh, when it comes to business? Yeah. So the physics stuff is really useful because it's not, it's not so much actual doing physics on business and yeah. it's the way that you solve problems and the way that you solve them in, uh, in applied physics is you look at the underlying, like what's the root cause effect relationship. Like you, you go, go you go all the way down to the bottom and you figure out like what, what's the, the one thing you got to do or to, to, to get the result that you want. <clears throat> and it could be very counterintuitive, Yeah. but if you did your, your work properly, then you know, it's right. And then, so you can execute with rigor and zeal. Right. And that's, that's the real, the benefit. It's, it's not so much the, the, the physics stuff. It's how, how you solve problems in physics. And so something might be counterintuitive and, and you go again and it's everyone saying, don't do it, don't do it. But if you go deep enough and you do the work properly and your assumptions are right, then it'll give you confidence to go and pursue a direction only based on the, 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 uh, the, the work that you did. Yeah. So yeah. in that sense, it's really, it's really useful. I use it in business. Um, yeah. You know what I love is from statistics is the central limit theorem, whereas an N approaches infinity, your returns start to look like a normal distribution. And I am not going to, I'm not, I only have one life to live, right? But Ben Graham had his life to live and so did Warren Buffett and so does Ray Dalio and so does Elon Musk. And I can read all of their biographies and I can use their experiences to help me. Same thing when I listen to you or if I, you listen to Russell Brunson or other people who've gone through different you know, iterations of their business, you can use their experience to help you grow uh, as a person rather than you touching the stove and figuring out that it's hot on your own. So I think that's a really massive advantage to having mentors and being able to read books in, in order to learn uh, a bunch of that stuff. Uh, this is something uh, you talked about before, you know, from from a, a scientific standpoint, if we have the scientific method is to have a hypothesis and to constantly be trying to disprove your own hypothesis. Um, you talked about following the wrong people. I love this video that you made. Um, can Can you expound on that? How you were following a guy, then you saw that maybe he wasn't as, as successful as you thought he was and how maybe that was um, a shift in paradigm for you. Yeah. So if you follow, like you can, if you follow the wrong person, it can be super costly. Like it could even be fatal. Yeah. So it's, it's important to like, it's not an accident that someone does well. Like they have a certain set of things that they did. There's it's, really nuanced and also you can't you can't just pick it up from a book to like either like you need books and and that stuff but you also need the mentorship because if anyone's ever written a book because like you, you've probably done some writing right like it's so hard to get everything on the like yeah everything down the amount of energy required to get even a simple concept down never mind your whole like what you did to get where you are yeah. is so so much energy that no one's really going to do that. Like Warren Buffett could write a book, but it's probably like 0.001% of what you need to do. Yeah. Cause it's so nuanced. So, and it takes so much energy to, to write it. So I think the, one of the only ways is to, to learn is to, is to follow somebody and stick to them like glue once you find the guy. 
And if you, if you find the right guy, you're going to accelerate really, really fast. And if you find the wrong, if you follow the wrong guy, you're just going to stay put. What, or what, you're not gonna... what are some of the things we're going to see when we're following the wrong guy versus following the right guy? When you follow the wrong guy, it's hard. It's too hard, right? Like you're doing it, but it's, you're not, I'll contrast it to when you follow the right guy, it's easy. And you're like, where were you 10 years ago? Right. Like, why wasn't I doing this 10 years ago? So when you follow the right guy, things work, things are easy. And it's usually exponential growth. Got yeah. it. That's awesome. That's really, that's a really good litmus to look for right there. Um, average versus superstar. I also like this video. There were certain things when you talked about having sales associates, what are some of the, and it seemed to be in, in every one of these cases, it was a mindset that caused someone to be a superstar versus average. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there's a few things that make, make superstars superstars. Um, yeah. In, a superstar just is, is, has this really intense desire to do well. Like, I think there's something inside, like it, there's some predisposition where they need to be the top person, right? They need to be the winner and they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to be the winner. And sales is a great lane for them because they get to, they get to compete. Right. So um, yeah, first of all, that's the, the main thing is you need to have that disposition where you need to, you want to make a lot of money for whatever reason. Um, and then the superstars, they treat it like a sport. So they're disciplined. They manage their environment extremely well. They're, they're concerned, like the distance between the chair and the monitor, the distance between the bathroom and the kitchen, right? Like these little things like in their, in their, in their, uh, in their job matter a lot. And so when a superstar will optimize for, uh, like, a, like, a, like a formula one car driver, right? They'll optimize for these little tiny things. Um, yeah, they don't get phased. They focus on the numbers and they're, they're just trying to, um, they're trying to get as much output as possible. Yeah. So when you come across a superstar, hold on to them, especially if they're in your business, because those people will make you millions and millions of dollars. And if you are a superstar, you better find a really good product because you can make a ton of money. Yeah. Probably. One of the things I really liked uh, was when you were discussing about a, a somebody who is average, they interpret signs as being greater than they are and someone who is a superstar uh, under representing their success. Do you, do, you, do you recall what I'm talking about here? Uh, can you can you go into that? Because I thought that was really I do meet people like this, you know, that basically they have some leads and they assume that these are going to be sales. Whereas, you know, I, I had a situation where we artificially had a really good month because I had done some marketing stuff. I had gone on some podcasts that were extremely popular. And I remember telling my sales team over and over again, I was like, I like, this is an anomaly because we went on this podcast. We should not let rest on our laurels. We have got to find other sources of traffic because this is not a business model. Can you go into that a little bit about uh, underrepresenting and overrepresenting your success? Yeah. So salespeople like an amateur will get a few, a little bit of success and they'll think that it's going to last forever or they get too high. Right. Um, and on the other hand, if they, they struggle a bit, they get too low and like they fall off a cliff. Right. And maybe they, maybe never, they'll never get up again. Right. But the, the superstar and someone who's really seasoned, they're just more calibrated and they're just, they, they, they don't, their mood doesn't fluctuate too much. If they do really well, they make a hundred grand in one day. Great. If they lose a hundred grand. Great. Like they, they're just, they don't, um, they're not, they don't use wishful thinking and um, they're just more even keeled. Right. Yeah. And this comes from, ex comes with experience. Yeah. Um, I come from the financial community. I work for a stock option bro or I work for a stock option brokerage and I work for a small hedge fund. And I find the same thing to be the case with traders. I've seen guys down seven figures in a day before, and they just go to lunch like every other day because they realize you know, hey, this is this is just they just they, they don't even like there's no woe is me, there's no pity, no whatever. It takes a certain type of individual to do that. Also, I live in Las Vegas and I meet some guys who are um, you know, professional sports betters. And these guys are the same, like there's this similar mindset. Now with them, I, I think the math doesn't work in their favor. That's personally my opinion. But uh it's just really interesting when I deal with individuals like that. It's almost like their amygdala doesn't work properly when they're yeah, taking massive that'll... amounts of risk. I've done that like with the, with portfolios and, and working with some of these funds and even trading my own money, yeah. like it's up and down, like in the, it takes, I think two years to get completely blunted. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. And it's not fun. Like you're sometimes like, well, I remember when I was doing that, I was like curled up in a ball, like up, up a million, down a couple million, up a million. I, I, I remember the first time I was down 600 grand in a day during the Corona crash. And I, and I was talking, I was just calling my mom and she's like, no, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's cool. And I'm just like calling mentors and trying to figure out, you know, what to do and everything kind of like, I look back on it now and I'm like, I, it was a very expensive lesson to learn, but I'm glad I learned it. And you're right. You do kind of get desensitized to it. Uh, I, I, I liken it to when you join the military, especially if you're in the infantry, they put you behind this berm and they start firing live ammunition at you. Uh, so you can hear what it's like to hear live bullets being fired fired at you, knowing full well that if you stick your head up, you could die. And you do that after a while. The first time you do it, your heart rate's in the 150s, then it's 130s, then like the third or fourth time, it's in the 100s. And then finally, by the last time, like you look at your sergeant and he's just like, he's almost asleep. He doesn't care at all. Like you're right. so immersed in it and so desensitized to it. And that's again why like rule number three in the Men of Action program is abundance is almost always the answer. More sales experience right? More marketing experience, a, writing a better offer, writing a better sales letter. How do you get better at these things? You just do more of them. You just keep putting up more shots and that's how you, that's how you improve. Um, all right. Awesome. This is the, the Holy grail, man. Paid traffic. Can you talk about this? So, uh, what, what are some things where, uh, people go wrong? Uh, I just did a, a interview with a huge influencer in the last week. First thing he told me afterwards, he goes, Hey man, pay to p promote this on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I kind of gave it away. You probably figured out who it is. Uh, the, uh, the, so, so uh, what, can you talk about where people go right and people go wrong when it comes to pay traffic? Yeah. Okay. So before, so first of all, pay traffic used to be a lot easier Yeah. because of the platforms they were still like in their infancy and they're getting adoption. Like, but there were still advertisers and businesses that were not fully using the online media. So there was an opportunity for young marketers or like early businesses to capture the inefficiencies there. And um, they're, first of all, they're the best platforms ever because you can target based on like region and you can be very specific with the targeting. And that that technology hasn't existed before. Like there's me other media, there's radio, there's TV, right? Like this is super uh, targeted. You can reach, if you want to reach somebody in India tomorrow, you could do that with a credit card. So they're imp it's important. Um, and it's really powerful, but recent, uh, so before they used to work fine, right? You could, uh, it, it functioned as an auction and you're competing against other people in the, uh, in the auction for this, the cost of the eyeball. And if you had a better mark, if you had better marketing and you had a higher margin thing, you could outcompete them and you, and you could buy up the, the, the traffic and dominate the channel. Right. And that's kind of how it works. So, um, there was a wrench thrown in 2020. First of all, there was new privacy rules that that uh, were implemented and, and restrictions, like the way that some of the platforms were collecting data. They weren't allowed to collect data in the same way, so they had to like re-engineer the whole thing. And and um, and and that was like a year and a half of of um, of challenging times for me for paid media buyers. So that's one thing. So you have to figure out how to buy using these new privacy. Um, rules. I, and keep in mind, I think the platforms are fine. The Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters, the TikToks, they're fine. Like they're still there. The, um, I wouldn't worry about the privacy stuff because the, the lattice that they have is so developed that um, they're just probably not going to show you every little thing like they used to, but at, you, you can bet your bottom dollar that they, they uh, it is, it is still accurate. Um, one, one thing that's happening now is that there's something called differential pricing. So you call if if your offer is too, if you're spending too much money and you're signaling that you're doing too well, then you're you're you'll start competing with yourself at the at the at the marketing level, right? So the the, the platforms they're optimizing for their profit, right? And if they're like, okay, well this guy's spending two hundred thousand dollars a month or a million dollars a month, and he's still spending it and he's spending more, well that that signals that there's margin to be had there. And we're going to up the prices only relative to this buyer because we know that he can afford it. So in that sense, you're, you, you're less likely to scale big campaigns like you used to be able to because of this differential pricing thing and things are just getting more efficient. So um, what's the solution to that? You need, lo you need a long form um, viral sales letter. Because 
if if the if the or this is the ad, the sales letter is the ad, right? Same thing. So if the ad is good enough, or if the sales letter is good enough, then you can get it into people and it picks up momentum and legs on its own, uh, on its own and, and travels through word of mouth, which the platforms can't, um, they can't throttle, right? Like they can with the views of the normal paid traffic. So to combat the higher prices and the price, uh, um, differential pricing that the platforms are using, you want to create these viral, uh, long form sales letters. And the way to do that, there's a whole process. That's what we do. Uh, there's a whole process. It's a lot of work, but when you get it right, it just, it, it, it pumps. Is, and that's how you can get a crazy, a crazy return on it, your, your, uh, ad spend. Is that sales letter what I'm seeing on Facebook or Instagram, or is what I'm seeing on Facebook and Instagram taking me to a page with that sales letter? It, it takes you to a page with the sales, the, letter. the sales letter. So, yeah. so just an example that everyone might notice, you know, 71 million views, Ty Lopez. Hey, here I, is my garage. This is my Lamborghini. It's fun to drive. I'm here in the Hollywood Hills. Here's three simple steps. Click the link below. You go to the link below and it's a 90 minute sales letter that Ty, he yeah. said it took Ty, him years to, 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 to build something like that. Yeah. Ty, that's, that's a, a really good example of a long form viral sales letter Okay. because yeah, um, that thing went like viral yeah. too. So he spent a ton of money on ads, but then it also got picked up by everybody hating on it and everybody commenting on it. And it, it made him a lot. So um, yeah, I yeah, that's it. That's a really good example of a long form viral sales letter. So I, uh, uh, I, Dan, you know, Dan Fleischman is, um, he, uh, he runs model citizen fund and he's a huge marketer in here in uh, Los Angeles does a bunch of crypto stuff. He has this thing called elevator nights that I speak at sometimes. So Dan was throwing his birthday party at Ty's house. Ty was not in town at this point. And so I walk around with a bunch of models. There's a bunch of Instagram models there. And, uh, and I have this like um, this robe on, like uh, Hugh Hefner, not Hugh Hefner, um, uh, Harry Potter. And I'm walking around and I'm in his garage, his Lambo's behind me. And I was like, and I'm talking to this girl. I was like, hey, you know what you need? <laughs> He's like, you don't need more Instagram followers. You need knowledge. I went into every room in his house with these girls. And I'm like, you know what? You don't need these fucking cars. You just need some knowledge. It was so funny. I sent it to Ty. I thought it was hilarious. But yeah, um, that was his house on Rexford, the one he got before he moved out to uh, to to, Phil, to uh, Pennsylvania, or he moved out to Virginia. Um, so let's talk about a couple of other things. So the, the, the opposite of that. So we talked about the paid traffic, but there's uh, something that you can do to supplement that. And Ty did this, and a lot of other people. Grant Cardone has done this. Um, we talked about Andrew Tate before, Cobra Tate. He's definitely done this. Um, and I'll give you an example. There's a buddy of mine who's running for political office here in Nevada, and he has done no work on his social media platforms. And then now that he's running for office, he's trying to create an organic social media presence. And I'm like, bro, this is way too late. Like, if you came on my podcast right now, you'd get 100 views. And I try to explain to them like the the organic part you're investing in it. Like you're, I tell everyone have a TikTok, everyone have a Twitter. I tell everyone have an Instagram, have a Facebook, have all these different platforms because these things are able to give you free organic traffic. And that was the thing I wanted to talk to you about: how important it is to have an organic uh, channel and how you can use that to offset maybe some of the costs or to supplement your paid traffic. Yeah. So what what it looks like is it's like an umbrella, right? So Typically, there's one thing that um, that launches you to a point where you get all these views and you do it profitably. And mm. that's like in Ty's instance, there's the 67 step thing with the long form sales letter. Yeah. So that enabled him to, to spend millions of dollars on ads and and do it profitably and then build like this big uh, social following from that initial launch. Okay. So um and that's a common thing with other with other uh, marketers. Typically, there's like one campaign or one product that just knocks it out of the park, provides them with the momentum uh, and profit to go far with and get a lot of reach. And then once you have that reach, then you um, you sort of insulate it with the market, like your social and your marketing, and you start nurturing your your audience. But to get the audience in the first place, like there needs to be something spectacular um, to start, right? So. It's a, it's a, it's a, once you have that audience for sure. It's like the biggest uh, asset that you can uh, that you, that you can maintain. I think it was I think it was a clever investor. I can't remember who it was. He was on stage. I don't want to misquote anybody, but he openly talked about buying followers. He openly talked about buying a blue check mark. Uh, I I talked to someone recently, and they said that kind of the opposite is happening now. Where if you bought a blue check mark, 
And, and for those of you who are confused, don't be. You can buy, buy a blue check mark. I don't give a fuck what Instagram tells you. 100% you can. I'll, I'll introduce you to 25 people who've done it. Uh, the, the thing about it is it seems like there, a, a lot of people are losing their accounts. Uh, I, has that been something that you've seen change? I've seen people buy other people's accounts. I've seen people buy followers. I've seen people buy blue check marks in order to build a brand. In fact, very frequently I've seen it, like especially with male influencers, I've seen this pretty frequently. Do you have any opinion on that pro or, or con? Like I've, I haven't done a lot of the press stuff. I haven't done a lot of like the status stuff. Cause it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. Like, and for me, I get a, I get crazy return by solving a problem. Yeah. And and they like like I'm I'm good. Like I don't need extra whatever because like the product sells, the ads sell. Um, maybe the blue check mark will help a little bit. I haven't really pursued. I actually hired a guy to write some articles, and it just was the worst thing ever. He was like a friend of a friend, and he's like, yeah, like you need press. I was like, okay. And then I do the press. And then I, there's another piece that's saying, Hey, this guy paid for press. I'm like, Oh, this is just a big, like, yeah, it was just not, not worth it. Um, especially if you have something that's good. Yeah. Um, will it help with marketing? Probably a little bit, but I also know a lot of influencers that are broke. Yeah. I, like they're blue check mark and they're doing all this stuff, but they're like broke. So I advise my clients to focus on build, solving a problem for their customers and writing banger sales letters that when they go out into the market, they just print money. So yeah, I, I'm probably not the best guy to talk about blue check marks because I don't know. I've yeah. had success without them. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And then you also talked about using, uh, I guess, maybe micro influencers in order to using their brands or their channels in order to market your product. Yeah, that's another good one. It's not regulated yet, right? Yeah. So some of the, the so the paid traffic is starting to get regulated with the differential pricing and whatnot. So the the it's there's still a window. This is why I think like doing podcasts and doing um, like linking off other influencers is a really good idea because your followers are still your followers right now. Like there will be a time in the future where the platforms will be will say, hey, if you want to reach your followers, you're going to have to pay X amount of dollars. Like you don't actually own that audience. We do, right? So right now that, that, that point is not here, but it's probably going to be here in the next few years. So there's a window to exploit this uh, early uh, phase of the channel. Yeah. Got it. Uh, what do you think, uh, if you were going to go back and say, you know, somebody wants to start a business like this, what do you think is the most important thing that they need to know? Where, is, where are some of the pitfalls that you see when somebody starts um, a business like this? Spending too much money up front, hiring the wrong people, listening to the wrong people. What are, what are some of the pitfalls you see? Like a business, what type of business? So in this case, we'll just talk about SaaS businesses. Uh, somebody wants to get into this space. They haven't even discovered your business yet. What are some of the things that you regularly, like I'll, I'll tell you for me, the one that spoke to me the most was I follow my gut. I, I tell my friends all the time, you want like a great way to be broken alone is to follow your gut. I, all these memes about follow your passion, like no, solve someone else's problem. Solve yeah, someone yeah. else's problem, you will become rich. Follow your passion, you will have a pink donut, vegan donut shop that nobody fucking goes to. Fo fo you know what I'm saying? That's what I, I try to tell people. What are, what are some of the pitfalls that you see frequently? Um, the pitfall, like why people fail? Yeah, it's why because fail. Th they they don't have they're not good marketers. That's the thing. Because like with good marketing, this is the this is one of the the, the key concepts that I talk about. Um, with there's an interdependence between marketing sales and product. So if you have, uh, if you can do marketing, even if you have no product at all and you suck at sales, you'll eventually solve sales and then you'll get enough awareness from the market that you'll eventually learn of a painful problem and then build it. So the solution to product as counterintuitive as this may sound is marketing. The solution to sales is marketing. So the highest leverage um, activity that one can do, especially a founder, is learn how to effectively market. Nice. Okay. Yes, that makes sense. Um, the I want to ask you this also because I saw 
you know, there's this videos you hanging out in the Lambo and walk around with no shirt on with uh, with Greg. How do you balance your social life and your business life? You see, I mean, you talked about being a a top performer versus an average person. I know some of these people are obsessed. They have no social life like that. It is nothing but making money. Do you have is this a balance that you struggle with or is this something you've learned later on or do you or do you have a balance when it comes to that? So that's a really good question. You don't have a balance when you're building up stuff. Like you are a you're you're completely immersed in whatever you're doing. You need three to four years of like complete and utter just disciplined work and no social to really do something like noteworthy and 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 make a lot of money. So the answer is it depends where you are in your journey, right? Like once you get that first like thing under your belt, then you operate in seasons. So you work for six, eight months, or maybe you work for a year and then uh, you go take a year off, right? Or you work for two years and then you go take a year off. And, and so, yeah, like some of that stuff, it's like, I took, I took a year and a half off, um, but I worked for 10 years. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just like, I gave up like when you, when you, when I was 20, like I gave up, I didn't go out drinking. I didn't do any of that stuff. Like just utter obsession yeah. for like the first couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Is there a new piece of technology that you're excited about? Uh, I know when, when uh, initially when they, you started being able to do retargeting on some of these platforms, that was a huge thing for that. A lot of marketers were excited about. And I know some of that has been peeled back because of the problems that Facebook has had the legal problems that Facebook has had. Is there something that you're looking forward to in the future as far as marketing is concerned, some piece of technology or some new idea that people aren't exploiting? I think, well, the new idea is, is the dynamic sales letter. Okay. And that's, that's the, and because I've been at this for so long, I've worked with so many customers and the thing that kept the highest leverage thing I could help them do is create the, their pitch, their dynamic pitch. Um, I think that with, so with the new, there's a lot of stress on the population, right? Um, there, with the currency stuff, uh, with the, with high inflation, and what's that? What that is doing is it's it's pu it's putting a lot of pressure on businesses to be as lean and as useful as possible. So businesses are going to collapse down to their core, like their core offer, the one thing that they're good at. That's what happens in like recessions. They're going to be um, focusing on that one thing, and they're going to cut all the all the unnecessary stuff. So I don't I don't believe that there's going to be a requirement for hundred person, two hundred person sales teams. There's not going to be a requirement for uh, fifty person marketing teams. I think that the 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 most efficient state is going to be a superstar marketer who's just who can write bangers. In, in even at a big company, you just need one guy or girl who can write bangers, who can leverage some of this uh, tech because you can reach millions of people, right? I like I did it, you did it from I did it from an apartment, right? Like there's people that can reach millions of people from wherever, um, and then at the sales level, you're gonna be using videos and um, and processes to be super efficient. So I think. I think it, it, uh, everything is going to get really efficient, and, and and that's what happens when you if you print a bunch of money and you you have uh, high inflation. Like the businesses are still going to be profitable; they're just adapting by by uh, uh, exploiting and inventing new tech. And I think this is that's where it's going to go. Yeah, it seems. And just tell me if this is the impression you get. Like no matter what you find as an inefficiency. So like you mentioned, Ty Lopez with the. YouTube ads and previous, the, the, I know a lot of guys who were doing a lot of Facebook ads. It feel, and then you said the, the, the pricing changes based on how successful you are there. It feels like wherever you find alpha in this market, eventually someone comes to catch you and you have to continue to, to pivot. Does that seem yep. accurate? Yep, that's right. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, very cool. Very yeah, that's cool. a good way to put it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, can you go, if you went back to the beginning of your journey and you could tell yourself a few things, uh, what would you go back and tell yourself? Um, what would I tell myself? That's a good question. I would probably would, when something's like working, push it really hard. Got it. Because I did like, yeah. 
when something's working, push it really, really hard. Before, That's what I would before you have to pivot, right? If you, yeah. if you 10 X to whatever the thing is while it was working, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And like, <sighs> put, if, it, if it's, cause it does take a long time to, to get the stars to align and to, to get something working. And so when it does work, then you like, you push it until you cannot push it anymore. Yeah. If you were, uh, if you were going to go back, uh, like I tell, you know, whenever I, I meet young kids, I was like, what, what are some of the things that you can sort of find a job in any market? Uh, sales is always one of the things I tell them. Coding is another big thing now that guys can code. Uh, if you can write a sales letter, if you, if you could go back and say there's one thing you'd want someone, say maybe he's 18, 19, wants to get into this industry, what's a one thing that they could focus on initially to get really good at? It would help them. Writing banger sales letters. Because you can write code, but there's also guys that are, like in any industry, like there's, there's a guy or girl who's a hundred X better than you, right. even if you're good at coding. Right. And so unless you are like super interested in it, like the coders that are really good at coding, they've been coding since they were like six years old. Right. And um, so unless like you really love coding and computers and building software, like the, then I wouldn't, you can learn a little bit about that stuff. Um, to communicate with engineers, but and to recognize good engineering talent. But um, if that's not your like thing, I would, and your thing is more business or sales and marketing, I would definitely learn sales letters, which is uh, it's like coding for marketing because it is it it is super technical and it is a process a process to it, and there's creativity involved. And it's also high leverage. Without a good sales letter, what are the coders going to code? Right. They don't have any. They don't have any customers to code for. So, in in, in that respect, it's actually more high leverage than um, uh, than the coding. And that's why the marketers make money. Like, how else would you explain a twenty one year old kid making millions of dollars? Yeah, right. That makes sense. I, I also liked one thing you said before. Is like you think you're going to hire a marketer to do this for you, and you're like, well, if the marketer was that good at doing it for you, he'd be your competitor. Yeah. Yeah, so that you can't just find somebody to just go out there and flip a switch or pay them some money and then make it happen, right? Yeah, and that's one thing that we have an offer that's uh, become a growth consultant. And a growth consultant is essentially a marketer that goes into a company, writes a dynamic sales letter, solves the marketing, scales up the business, and gets gets a case study. And so that's where it's going. That's where the, um, if if you're looking for something to do, and you want something high leverage and that pays really well, learn those skills, work with the company because they need you more than they need air right now and um, create a, cr a crazy amount of value on their dime because you can test with a product that already exists. You can, uh, you can sharpen your, uh, or you can cut your teeth with a, with marketing budget of a company. And they'll, if you're good enough, they'll give you the reins and you can, you can scale up a business. So that's what I did. That's how I started. And I don't see a, a more efficient path um, than that. Incredible. Awesome, man. So um, last question I want to ask you. So you, uh, you are, you know, you founded sales process IO. What is the thing that makes you guys unique in this, in this particular field? So we, so no one really went deep into sales and marketing mechanics. So my background was like, I went deep into, like I studied um, applied physics, right? And that you learn about motion and you learn about atoms and all this other stuff. Like there's domains where people went really deep, right? And they have like mechanics to everything. But when it came to sales and marketing, it was still very, like, it wasn't deep. It was just, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of it con contradicted it. it it's, it's like, it was still not developed at all. Yeah. And so like what, what I did was I just went a little deeper. I, I looked at a bunch of stuff and I went deeper and uncovered some, um, some, uh, some cause effect relationships that are, that are useful. And it's like a, it's a framework to, to do sales and marketing that went a little bit deeper than, than uh, the other stuff that was out there. And is it the most, uh, is it is it as deep as it can go? No, but it's it's we're still going and we're still getting we're we're uncovering and it's been really productive for the people that have used it. Yeah, 
So that's the real, it's the, the meshing of the engineering with the sales and marketing domain that is the unique to us. Yeah. Incredible, man. I want to say thank you again uh, for coming out here. It's, it's awesome for us to have an expert like you to come to talk about a bunch of these things, because in reality, you know, there's so many people who have, you know, coaching programs or want to start an e-commerce business or something like that. And there's, um, you know, the, so again, look, I, I give you the example. I have a bunch of friends who started podcasts around the same time I did, and they made it 10 episodes and then they quit. And the reason why they quit was because after 10 episodes, they legitimately thought that the conversations that they were having with themselves in the shower was going to be the thing that carried the podcast. And I told them, no, it's going to be virality on TikTok. It's going to be virality on Instagram. It's going to be virality on Twitter. It's going to be vir virality on Facebook. And then sending all that traffic back, it, it just a different form of marketing and not, not thinking that, hey, it's just it, all it has to do with is, you know, the, the, your content or, you know, how good the business is. The way you explain how the offer works, the sales funnel, your sales team, and your um, your your sales letter that makes it a lot makes it make a lot more sense because uh, you know sales is an art form in in and of itself. So I want to say thank you for coming out uh, and explaining a lot of these concepts uh, to to a lot of my audience. I, I really appreciate that, man. Where can people find you? Salesprocess.io, salesprocess.io, and you can find me at uh, Instagram too. I post. Uh, post there mostly stories and stuff like that. It's my main channel. Nice, yeah. nice. Do you want to you want to come but judge my bikini competition this summer? Yeah, yeah. You want to come do it? Send you me an be, invite. You can be in Vegas. Uh, yeah, I love going to Vegas. Straight up. Next every Friday for the next twelve weeks, we're giving away one hundred and thirty grand. So come on by, man, if you want to do it. I know. And it's again, you like your the look on your face. This is the reason why I get that I don't believe you shit all the time is because I'm like, yeah, by the way, I'm going to go play paintball over at Bulzarian's house. Oh, and here's how you do this in your life as well. And people are like, fuck you. None of this is true. That's the problem. I, that think, I, I, I think I saw your sales page yeah. or something because one of the guys, the growth consultants may be working on it yeah. and he posted it in the group. And yeah. I was like, this thing is awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. So, yeah, I saw that it was one of the sales pages that was very well done. So, um, yeah, I was, it was, it was cool. Well, yeah. I'd love to have you come out here and, and, and check some of it out. I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm the host of swimsuit USA's world championship. And I'm also the host of the, uh, the playboy summer search at wet Republic. And I'm also the host of, uh, babes in Toyland a charity. And I'm also the host of, um, paradise challenge. So we're doing all that stuff kind of stuff. And I teach people, how do we build s similar social events for you in your life? That's basically what our offer is for, for my program. That's such a good, that's such a good offer yeah. and it's such a good problem to solve. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate it, man. Well, I look forward to working with you guys uh, in the future. Uh, you guys get, make sure you all check them out. Sales process. I O uh, we will see you hopefully in the future. I'd love to have you come back on again. We can have this discussion. Maybe we can have an open uh, forum uh, dis debate or discussion about different topics but thank you sure. so much for joining us nick and for the rest of you guys man i am so excited um for the people who have reached out to me recently to come on this program uh, like i said before cobra tate and i we go back uh, over and over again we're going to eventually get him on here i got wes watson on next week for those of you who don't know who wes watson is watson fit he's the guy who went to jail for 10 years and he screams at people on his youtube channel he's got half a million subscribers some of the most motivating crazy stuff i've ever heard i am so excited excited to have him on. Uh, I want to say thank you to Ty Lopez for coming back on and, and talking to Ty Lopez and I did the longest one we've ever done. It was three hours and 45 minute uh, uh, interview where Ty basically went over his entire life. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm just really excited because it, this is just going to open the door for so many other guests that are going to come on in the future, you know, uh, that I want to get on. And like I said before, I'm still waiting for OJ Simpson to come on the podcast. Hopefully we'll get him on here eventually. But anyway, guys, I want to say thank you so much. Please like, share and subscribe, and I will see you all next week.